Philippines ranked 15th out of 63 countries in terms of income inequality, according to a World of Bank. The top nine richest billionaires in the Philippines have more wealth than the bottom half of the Philippine population. Put another way, these nine billionaires are richer than 55 million Filipinos. Today, we'll learn the circumstances that allowed such a wide financial divide in the country. From 1UP Media, this is Empires. The Philippines has one of the largest financial divides in the world. The Gini coefficient, or index, measures income distribution across the population. In theory, if the Gini coefficient is zero, it assumes that every resident has the same income. While if one person earns all the income of the country, then the coefficient is one. Generally, within the Asia-Pacific region, Average Gini coefficients are 0.35, already higher than the OECD average. But in the Philippines, that number is over 0.4. Even if measured via an alternative index, such as the P90P10, which compares the income of the 90th percentile earner versus the 10th percentile, the Philippines still routinely ranks in the top two with a score of around 14. This means that the 90th percentile income is 14 times higher than income at the 10th percentile. Why the Philippines has such a high income distribution seems unusual, particularly since it has one of the highest English literacy rates in the region. This gives a sizable part of the population the English advantage which refers to the disproportionate amount of resources in the English language. A Southeast Asian who is fluent in English could, in theory, tap into the vast pool of knowledge available on the internet to learn a wide variety of practical skills and escape poverty. And yet, this is not the case in the Philippines. The reason behind this lies in a couple of phases in Philippine history. Historically, the Philippines has about 319 dynastic families involved in businesses and politics. The political tree includes the Marcos, Aquino, Binay, Macapagal, Duterte, and Rojas families. Whereas the business side includes the Ayala, Aboitis, Cojuanco, and Ongpin clans. These families of power can trace their ancestry mostly to the Spanish and the Chinese. And the oldest of these families are the Ayalas. From the 1500s to the late 1800s, the Philippines was under Spanish rule, welcoming a whole swath of Spaniards, including a Spanish aristocrat who came to establish a distillery. The aristocrat, named Antonio de Ayala, along with his family, would soon open other businesses as well, including a bank, shopping malls, and today, one of the top fintech applications, Gcash. Back to the dynasties. These families began aggregating wealth and power, often unchecked, which began the first wave of inequality in the Philippines. After World War II, the families continued forming deeper relationships, including cross marriages with one another eventually leading to the rise of Ferdinand Marcos in November 1965. The Marcos family's political dynasty can arguably be traced back to the late 1800s, when Mariano Marcos y Rubio was elected as a congressman. In his time, Mariano Marcos became a key player within the House, serving as chair of the House Committee addressing multiple issues from infrastructure to natural resources. In 1935, it was well known that Mariano had desired a political seat of power in the government, which he lost to his political rival, Julio Nalundasan. Shortly after, Nalundasan mysteriously dies, which embroils the Marcos family into controversy. During the investigation, 
Mariano's son, Ferdinand Marcos, was charged for the murder of Nalundasan and given the death penalty. But through political connections, his conviction was overturned. The Supreme Court Justice, Jose P. Laurel, had seen himself in Ferdinand Marcos. Like Ferdinand, he was convicted for murder during a brawl, but eventually acquitted after appealing to the Supreme Court. He figured that Ferdinand Marcos, who was a law graduate, could equally benefit the public like he did and decided to acquit him of murder. The trial shot Ferdinand Marcos to fame, which made it ideal for the Marcos family to enter politics once more. And true enough, Ferdinand Marcos was elected the 10th president of the Philippines in November 1965. His era allowed many others from the Marcos family to take up various positions of power. But more importantly, it created massive inequality. In 1972, public discontent had risen. And to exert control, Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law. Using the military, which he had successfully expanded to over four times its original size, Ferdinand Marcos began nationalizing industries. His strategy was to protect key industries and create government-owned monopolies. During this period, land and business assets from both private and public sectors were seized, then redistributed to a group of Marcos loyalists. These loyalists would then form large monopolies that were awarded government contracts. Nationalizing resources is not a ridiculous concept. Depending on how they are managed, nationalized resources can be helpful. For example, in protecting and maintaining a clean water supply. However, in the case of the industries nationalized during the Marcos regime, the contracts signed had very dubious commission structures and award procedures. For example, in 1973, the administration wanted to build a nuclear power plant to supply electricity within the region. Two competing proposals were submitted. The first was from General Electric, a national conglomerate, at $700 million, while the second was from Westinghouse Electric at $500 million. After running the numbers, contracting with General Electric made more sense as they had detailed specifications and a breakdown, but Westinghouse Electric did not. So the committee picked General Electric, only to be overruled by Marcos in June 1974. Turns out, Westinghouse Electric had hired a close ally of Marcos to lobby against General Electric, and this won them the contract. In the years that followed, the final cost of the nuclear power plant under Westinghouse Electric's leadership ballooned to $2.2 billion, while producing only half the power of the original proposal. The breakdown of where the money went is unclear, but a total of $25 million in compensation was awarded to the lobbyist. This was one of the many incidents that spanned across multiple industries from agriculture, mining, oil, and telecommunications. Because of the size of the contracts, it was assumed that if Ferdinand favored your industry and you, you aren't just set for life. Your children and your grandchildren can live off the money earned off these contracts. This created one of the widest divides, most noticeably among 12 associates that were appropriately named the Rolex 12. The rise of the Rolex 12 brought new wealthy families into power that could rival legacy families and provide support to Marcus's administration. By the 1980s, the term crony capitalism was coined and used frequently to describe the dealings between the administration and the members of the Rolex 12. During this period, 
the Philippine economy began to experience the dangerous effects of his administration. Particularly, the increase in long-term debt used to finance the Rolex 12. This would translate into public discontent and in 1986, explode into what we call the People Power Movement that led to Marcus's exile and the rise of Corazon Aquino as the 11th president and Fidel V. Ramos as the 12th president of the Philippines. While there's no data to describe inequality levels during this period, it is commonly agreed to have been astronomical, as a total of $30 billion worth of long-term debt was borne by the country, then redistributed to Marcos's allies. In fact, for Marcos himself, an estimated $10 billion ended up in his coffers. How has the Philippines progressed since the Marcos era? After the Ferdinand Marcos era, the next president sought to undo much of the damage caused by crony capitalism. One of the key contributions was by Fidel V. Ramos's administration, who began privatizing most industries to encourage competition. Much of the Philippines' nationalized industries had grown stagnant and lazy, since they were the monopoly and protected by long-term government contracts. One notable industry was telecommunications, in which the Philippines had severely lagged behind. In fact, it was so slow that then Prime Minister of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, joked that 98% of Filipinos are waiting for a telephone, while the other 2% are waiting for the dial tone. Under the Ramos administration, an executive order forced the telecommunications giant, PLDT, to open up its infrastructure for any new entrants to utilize. While it wasn't perfect, it introduced fair competition. And soon, many new companies came into the picture, such as Smart, Sun Cellular, Biantel, Islocom, Extelcom, and Globe Telecom. The latter, Globe, would come to fight PLDT as equals, changing the market into a duopoly. Other than prying open industries, Many other initiatives were put in place, including investments into availability of secondary school education, healthcare, and actual productive infrastructure. The latter is important, as under the Ferdinand Marcos era, a whole swath of infrastructure projects were done for solely aesthetic purposes. Additionally, the administration expanded to implement different degrees of social assistance programs in the form of government handouts. However, much of the progress took a hit during the period of 2019 to 2022. Because of COVID-19, many students' curricula were cut in half. This impacted the less wealthy students especially, since they couldn't afford the infrastructure needed to school from home effectively. During this period, many less qualified workers also returned to less productive sectors, such as agriculture. Is the Philippine problem a unique one? The Philippine problem of dynastic families isn't a completely unique one. In Japan, pre-World War II, a group of family-owned businesses known as Zaibatsus controlled a huge part of Japan's economy. To weaken their stranglehold, a couple of policies were introduced. One of them is through law. Thanks to laws preventing unfair competition and imposing a high inheritance tax, a Zaibatsu struggles to aggregate power like it did before. In fact, Japan's inheritance tax is the highest in the world at 55%. The second is heavy-handed asset control. The government seized control of family assets, liquidated holding companies, and broke apart large businesses into many segments. Eventually, a new form of quasi-zaibatsu was formed, which were privatized and less dynastic in nature, named 
the Keiretsus. Though they still hold huge wealth and power, they are integrated with the economy and not just limited to families, which helps further redistribute wealth. For South Korea, they suffered from a similar issue with the tables. And appropriately, South Korea has the second highest inheritance tax at 50%. Similar to Japan, they use a series of policies meant to force companies into integrating deeper with the economy. Of course, we are grossly simplifying the many policies and strategies to control these dynastic companies. But what's important to take away is that the Philippine problem is not a unique one. If Japan and South Korea could solve it, there's strong reason to believe that the Philippines could as well. But unless a political leader decides to prioritize the country's wealth over their own wealth, it would seem like an uphill battle. For perspective, the Philippines has a 0% inheritance tax, with only a 20% estate tax, which explains why wealth aggregation is so much easier in the Philippines. These families will likely remain in power for years to come, which might not be a bad thing, provided they choose to change the policies to truly benefit the country. All eyes are now on the current president, Bongbong Marcos, son of the controversial Ferdinand Marcos, who has taken office since 2022. By the way, if you want to know more about the telecommunications industry in the Philippines, then you might want to check out our podcast, Empires. In each episode, we take you on an epic audio journey, exploring the origin stories, monumental successes, and colossal setbacks of the company Globe Telecom, which rose to beat PLDT and reshaped the industry as a duopoly. Their battle would eventually birth a new industry and war dubbed the fintech battles between Gcash and Paymaya. But wait, there's more. We've got an extensive catalog where we unravel the rise of industry giants like Sony and the transformation of unicorns like Tencent into unstoppable monopolies. All right, that's all for me. Thank you for watching, and I hope we've left you with something to take back from the video. Till the next one, from 1UP Media, this is Empires.